Well, the Indonesian sword is fascinating because it's a very striking looking object with this huge open mouth Makara head at the top. And the sheer quality of this particular piece is quite outstanding. I, I've seen a number of similar swords, but this is, I think, probably the final example that I know. The handle is basically uh, made of beaten and engraved chased gold. There are little diamonds set on the, uh, in the hair at the back of the head. The open mouth dragon is, uh, can be either a Makara, which is the um, mythical creature that came from India, or a Naga. Naga is the um, snake or dragon depicted around the neck of the Garuda bird. And this is a particularly fine example. It's unusually got a tongue set with diamonds. It's got ruby eyes and uh, it's very fine proportions. And one of the features that is very common to the island of Sumatra, where this uh, sword comes from, is the, the use of two kinds of gold, the almost pure yellow gold and the very low coppery, uh, low carat gold, which they locally call sawasa. And on this particular saw, we've got a sawasa band at the, at the base here engraved. We've got a, a sawasa beard here. On top of the head, there's a diamond set in a, a gold mount. The base mount is also of sawasa. So you've got the use of sawasa uh, on this handle uh, in three places. The scabbard of this weapon is uh, red velvet. Incident, the hanging rings are an unusual feature because they didn't really, didn't really use hanging rings in Indonesia. It's a European uh, idea, and I'm sure this, these band of the rings have been copied from Dutch swords that were introduced by Dutch rulers in the 19th century. When I first saw it, I wasn't sure if it was from Sumatra or, or parts of Java. Cheribon in Java, Northwest Java, make similar animal-headed swords. But the blade, it's a pattern-welded blade, and it's got very highly polished edges, and that's very typical of the things made in the Palembang region of southwest um, Sumatra. It was either made for a, a local Raja, or possibly even made as a gift to a European, because I have had in the past very finely inlaid ivory crisses and, and other swords that actually were made and presented to you know, a Dutch dignitary in the 19th century. You know, maybe there was a history to it, one, one never knows. I've chosen this little dagger because it's a quite an extraordinary object. It's a combination, a marriage if you like, to be precise, of totally different elements. It's not actually a, a dagger at all, it's made into a dagger. The silver handle with the uh, lion head pommel and so on is Sri Lankan, and it's from a Sri Lankan sword. Sri Lankan da daggers are never of that construction with animal heads and, and so on. It's a very fine quality, probably late 18th century has a lion head a pommel called a simha in a Sri Lankan name. It's got little ruby eyes inlaid in gold, very, very fine quality silver um, engraving and chasing. The blade, in fact, is a water steel, plain water steel blade, which they didn't use in Sri Lanka, so I think it's probably cut down from Indian sword or dagger blade. The jade scabbard, on one side it has gold inlaid arabesques, this is typical of Ottoman, work, Ottoman court work from the 16th century. The other side has also gold uh, inlay work. And it would have had originally little gems, rather like these, set in flat, sort of Tur typical Turkish collets. At some stage in its life, somebody's removed the original gems and replaced them with, I believe these are garnets. So it's been constructed in the 19th century um, as a sort of made-up object. So the whole thing has been very, very cleverly and carefully put together. It makes a splendid looking dagger. Many years ago when I first came and saw it, I thought it was wonderful. But I think it's a fascinating example of one of the very few things in the Wallace collection that are not quite um, as it seems.